Welcome to episode three of season two, Keanu's. I'm Sharice Laprie at the Newhouse School at Syracuse University and joined, as always, by Professor Bob Thompson. Today, we are talking about classics Keanu. Now, for our listening audience, I will make the point that this was not in our season plan as originally envisioned, but as we started looking through the work and seeing the things that we had decided to keep and the things that we had decided to leave, uh, I felt that we really needed to tackle Bram Stoker's Dracula, Much Ado, and Little Buddha. Technically, we are two Keanu's, so we were trying to decide which two of these three, but as I learned right before we started recording, neither of us could discard any of them. So today we will be discussing all three. And what strings them together is that they are classic stories. These are not new narratives that have been created. We could talk a little bit about Half of Little Buddha, but definitely not the part that Keanu is in. That is a classic text. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula and Coppola has talked about how enamored he was with this story that was written at the same time as film was being invented, mm -hmm. produced, explored, and his desire to really embrace the original filmmaking techniques, thus putting a very distinct stamp on the visual uh, rhetoric of the film. And of course, Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, which uh, in many senses is not necessarily one of Keanu's most standout roles, but I think it marks a real turning point in the public awareness of who he is, what he brings to acting, what roles he's willing to take. And it's worthwhile to note that that film came out a year and a half, two years before his run as Hamlet in Winnipeg. That was a stage play that got a lot of coverage, primarily because it was Keanu Reeves. But for a lot of folks who were uh, eager to see Ted as Hamlet, <laughs> they quickly learned that that is not who Keanu is. Let's focus a little on Bram Stoker's Dracula before we get into the other two. But again, I'm, I'm so excited about how these three seemingly wildly disparate films connect and come together around this understanding of who Keanu Reeves is. So to begin, I'll let you to start. Uh, who's Keanu's character? in uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and what does he bring to this character? Well, I suppose we need to start off acknowledging the fact that uh, an awful lot of people out there do not celebrate Keanu Reeves' uh, performance in this, uh, uh, in this film. It has its own section of Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, well, what? Uh, uh, his Keanu okay. Reeves' critical reception. <laughs> okay, it's there a you whole go. section unto itself. So he's on lists of great miscastings of all time. He's on lists of uh, actors who ruined a movie. I mean, uh, uh, there are some people who feel pretty strongly uh, about this. I am not a linguist. I don't think his London vernacular is probably the most spot-on uh, accurate uh, uh, of all time. I personally didn't find it to be wildly worse than Winona Ryder's. Uh, neither. Well, and then she gets her share of uh, uh, dissing on this uh, for, for this film as well. We've waited this long, haven't we? We can be married when I return. <clears throat> of course. All right. But... If we're, of course, going to start judging movies by those kinds of details, I've got news about a lot of very beloved films that we're going to have to uh, uh, have problems uh, uh, problems with. I didn't find, and I remember seeing this film after I had already read lots and lots of bad uh, reviews about it, um, and didn't find it nearly so bothersome as many people did. I think this might get us back to the fact that this is 19, what, 92 is Bram Stoker's Dracula? Yes. So um, uh, this is only a few years after Bill and Ted. There is still this baggage that any audience member carries to Keanu Reeves. He's very well known for a, a, a particular role. And when suddenly he's playing this you know, serious role in a adaptation of a classic novel. Um, you're looking for reasons why you should hate it. But when the real reason you hate it is because he's not talking like Ted. He's not a, a surfer or uh, whatever. He's neither Ted, nor is he Gary Oldman, nor is he Anthony Hopkins, right? He's not, he's not what I want. 
and he's not what I obviously could have in this film. He's just somewhere in between. And he's the wor he gets the worst role in this entire thing. I mean, l let's face it. This is the uh, Dracula gets to be this this noble kind of uh, sexy, uh, right? Sexy. You describe my home as if you. In it first. Blood sucking, uh, uh, 500 year, 400 year old, however year old uh, uh, he is, uh, with a name we all associate with all the uh, things. Uh, and then, you, of course, you get the Anthony Hopkins who gets to play this, you know, kind of crazy doctor who's ahead of his time. Cut off her head and drove a stick to her heart and burned it, and then she found peace. Um, and then you get the uh, Winona Ryder, who gets to play a woman who somehow existed as Dracula's first love and now has come back again. A land beyond a great, vast forest. And who does Keanu get to play? <laughs> the guy who will be cuckolded. The guy who, I mean, he's, it, it is by far the um, uh, the worst role in the in, in the whole film. Well, I don't know the Carrie Elway's role in that great either. To be fair. Well, that's <laughs> true. What in God's name is going on up here? Oh, or but Tom Waits. I enjoyed Tom Waits. I will be one of those who benefits from your generosity. Yes, people are poo-pooing Keanu Reeves in this, but I think the emptiness that he brings, and he has said, you know, he did not act very well in it, and he'll leave it at that, is the quote from uh, an interview. But in his mediocrity, for me, it rationalizes Winona Ryder uh, or Mina's attraction to Dracula oh, in yes. so much that like mm -hmm. Keanu Reeves as an individual in this film or otherwise is and no offense to Gary Oldman way more attractive than Gary Oldman right but at the same time he's not a prince right so Gary Oldman brings this dy dynamicity if you will I don't think that's a word uh to the character and to her options in, you know, running off with him. But his emptiness of character, for me, really creates a juxtaposition that rationalizes her preference for this, you know, Transylvanian prince <laughs> who's clearly a creeper from the minute she meets him, but somehow she's enamored with him, which also doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, she's not... The thing is... In Keanu Reeves' terrible performance, his character makes sense as to why she leaves him, and so I'll take that. Which makes it not a terrible performance, and this gets exactly. where we get back all the time, and I know people want to say you're just trying to justify all of these Keanu Reeves films, but it isn't just a justification. You're absolutely right. In, in many ways, there are times when I watch this film, I think I'm watching Grease. Uh, you've got this, this, this woman who clearly plays by the mores and the rules of the, uh, of the time, and she meets this creepy guy Guy, but who's got the glasses and the hair, the hair and all that uh, uh, kind of stuff. And let's face it, there is that kind of bad boy thing uh, going on here. He speaks to wolves. He speaks to wolves, and he speaks in a exotic dialect, and uh, uh, and he likes her, and he moves on her. So if if you're gonna play Jonathan Harker. You kind of have to play him. He is a guy that he's plays cuckolded. by the rules, who's <laughs> going to be cuckolded, but who, um, he's a good guy. He's the guy that, uh, uh, that of course, Mina would want to marry. He's yes. the guy that can provide her with a future. She knows she's supposed to marry him. Right, and he, he has all the marriageable qualities. And what I think Bram Stoker's novel and so many other novels are about is that what we are supposed to marry or think or do or whatever uh, is often very contrary to what uh, the heart and the spirit and all these kinds of things uh, uh, desire. The heart wants what the heart wants. Right, and the heart doesn't want Jonathan Harker. And, and Keanu plays that just brilliantly in that he is, I wanted to cheat on Keanu by the time I was done with this movie. And, um, uh, but at the same time, he's he's always does the right thing. He p semi rescues her. I mean, he uh, 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 he is everything that is the kind of the noble uh, uh, protagonist. But he's not the hero. He's not the romantic uh, lead. And I think this film, I I if anything, I, I suppose I could use the word sabotages his performance. But 
it, it actually works perfectly for how we're supposed to, uh, to see him. And that is with these constant readings of his the journal. The district I am to enter is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia. I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. The Count, the way he looked at Mina's picture fills me with dread. I wrote three letters to the firm, to my family, and to my beloved Mina. I said nothing of my fears. As he now, a lot of people narrate. This has got multiple narrators, mm -hmm. multiple actual narra narrations uh, yeah. uh, here. Voiceovers, right. Um, but he's doing his journal, and uh, for one thing, it, it uh, accentuates the, his dialect and all of that, because he's doing it. It's, it's all audio. Um, uh, but secondly, it's kind of pedantic, and it's kind of, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then he goes away for, he's like the host of the Oscars. He goes away for large portions of the show. You could go out and have a sandwich and not meet, meet, miss any of uh, uh, Jonathan Harker's uh, dialogue. Um, but doesn't all that fit well for the kind of old-fashioned, and, and cuckold, maybe that's kind of an old word now, but uh, it kind of fits the idea that he is disposable, not only in Mina's heart, he's disposable in the narrative itself. If you had to get rid of one character, he'd probably be the easiest one to get rid of. Although, a uh, to, to couple points. One, uh, the term cuckold is making a comeback with the pejorative cuck. That's right, and that's one of the reasons I'm reluctant to use it. Exactly. Having said that, you know, Harker is your kind of quintessential cuck, is that you're giving up your woman to this man who you may not think it deserves it or whatever the case may be. Like, he is, like you said, by the end of the movie, you wanted to cheat on Jonathan Harker uh, because that's part of the character. If we're connecting to the theme of Keanu Reeves as playing on the underestimation of the audience, the film leads with Keanu Reeves's narrative after we get through the like mm -hmm. flashback, right? It leads with Keanu Reeves's narrative, Harker's narrative. So you're kind of led into this idea that you will be following this character, which is why when he leaves for a huge chunk of it, it feels jarring because this is the lens through which you have been asked to see this story. But you quickly learn that you are seeing whomever is with Dracula. So you're not seeing the story through the lens of Dracula. You're seeing Dracula's story through the lens of whoever's next to him. So for the first 20 minutes or whatever it is, it's Harker who's with Dracula and you're seeing Dracula through Harker's lens. Then it's Mina who's with Dracula and you see Dracula through Mina's lens, right? So, you know, I think that, and I'm generally not a Coppola fan, movies or wine, um, but <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that it's kind of playing on what you think you're supposed to see, and then he completely scuttles that by taking Reeves out for such a huge chunk of time. Yes, I think that's a really nice observation, and it not only does it keep changing these point of views, but always in terms of Dracula being the center. Yes. And let's face it, the novel is called Dracula. Uh, the film is called Bram Stoker's Dracula. But, but it also, on this wider scheme, I think, um, gets us into uh, uh, into the Mina character. Uh, of course, in the beginning, Mina only has eyes for Jonathan. Mm -hmm. um, and then <laughs> Jonathan disappears not only in her mind, but disappears in the narrative. He's off locked up in the castle with these harpy, With Monica whatever. Bellucci, who will come back as the <laughs> right. Marvingian's wife. There you go. Not to get ahead of myself. But he also disappears, and in, in many ways, to, to, our, in, to our minds. It's like when he comes back, it's like, oh, is he still around? And it is interesting how there's this parallel. Um, Dracula, of course, starts, we get the flashback, and it's the age of Columbus and all that kind of thing. Uh, but then he, of course, becomes this old, horrific-looking character. But by the time we move into him meeting Mina, he's become young again. He's become his, his old princely uh, self. Um, and what happens as the film goes on to Jonathan Harker? His hair turns gray. He's still got Ted hair, but it's gray. Yeah, and it gets grayer. I actually and made it a note grayer. of that. Although when they're fighting, like when they tr travel to the castle, I remember watching the hair is less gray. So it gets more gray and then somehow gets less gray. And I don't know whether that's a costuming error. Or although, a continuity error. That's or a, a good continuity question. error. But, uh, you know, costuming won an Oscar.
So maybe it was intentional. Wow, that's, uh, then I guess we've got to assume it was intentional. Yeah. But nevertheless, one goes from old and ugly to young and spectacular. Uh, another one goes from uh, young and spectacular to gray and, and spectacular. spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So then, um, and I guess, let me go ahead and get ahead of ourselves. I think I really want to talk about who Keanu Reeves is and what he brings to Much Ado About Nothing. Because when we talk about him leaving the narrative for big stretches of time, so does John, Don John, just gone. And his lines, okay, a couple of things. His lines in Much Ado, it's nothing. It's less than nothing, right? He He's barely got a presence on screen, but yet his character drives the entire body of that narrative. Had he not done what he did, you know, um, Claudio would not have been such a terrible human being. Right? <laughs> Throw down his wife, his fiance in front of the all of her family and friends. So even though his presence is minimal, the role is essential, is point one. Point two, you know, in its most cliche sense, it's also the first time we see Keanu Reeves with uh, facial hair. And, you know, how do you make a villain? You give them facial hair. Okay. And it just felt uh, very cliche on many levels. I'm feeling torn about the Much Ado, but uh, let me come to you. Who is Keanu Reeves in Much Ado, and what does he bring to that? Okay, first to your first point about uh, how he doesn't uh, have many lines. He doesn't say much. Uh, the line in Shakespeare is, I am not of many words. But I thank you. And before I forget, let's go with the uh, facial here, because but you're right. This is, he is really a villain. I mean, Don John is the villain of villains here. He's so Yago-like mm. uh, in that not only is the villain, he delights in his villainy. He's really into, he gets a pleasure, uh, I would say, that borders on erotic uh, at just being mean for the sake of being uh, mean. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. In this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, it must not be denied, but I am a plain dealing villain. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am, and seek not to alter me. And he's irrationally villainous, right? We see that there's a animosity between he and his brother, played by Denzel Washington, but you never get any of that backstory. It's just, he's just evil. Right, He he's rebelled against his half-brother, mm -hmm. uh, played by Denzel Washington. By the way, I think the best Don Pedro I have ever seen on film. Um, and the fact that he doesn't try to do an English, he, he does, uh, 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 he doesn't have to play English. He right. can play, he does that, this pretty much American language. His character, uh, Don Pedro, his half-brother, he's forgiven Don John. So he's, he, they've kind of, uh, you know, he's been, been allowed to come back with them and everything. So the motivation is, seems to be purely evil, or like Iago, we can speculate. Was Iago really in love with uh, uh, Othello? Uh, was, uh, did he think Othello was cheating on his wife? There's a million ways we can he, uh, 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 try to work that in. And in Shakespeare, he doesn't give it to you. You've got to kind of figure it out. But that beard, he, <laughs> he rocks that beard. Because if you notice, he never smiles. There is the one moment in the film when he's finally decided to leave and he's, he's, he's set the seeds for all his mischief. And it is mischief understates. It is really a horrible thing he's set up um, uh, that's going to result in the presumed death of someone and uh, the end of a, uh, a marriage and all the rest of it. And not only does he smile as he's about to leave, he laughs an evil ha 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 <laughs> but all the rest of it, he manages to completely stay that stone-faced uh, uh, thing. And his frown, which is literally like the kind a kid would draw, I mean, the, you know, the lines down on each uh, side, 
his mustache beautifully echoes that frown. So his entire face says Don John is kind of this sour, uh, sad uh, uh, kind of character. Um, I've said many times in in, uh, our our previous uh, discussions how Keanu's face is, of course, one of his great assets. And we see that face being used in ways we haven't seen it before. And that facial hair is really important. That mustache rhyming with his frown tells us not once, but twice what this guy is all about. Yeah. And when I mentioned uh, that we're doing Much Ado, the popular response, the most frequent response I've received is, and he's a villain in this one. And I, you know, drawing on that, the eagerness with which he has to diversify his public image through his roles is evident in choosing this film, again, having little to no lines, very little stage presence, the kind of diametric opposite to this good guy in Dracula, harmless uh, teenage uh, time traveler in Bill and Ted, you know, the good guy in uh, Point Break. Although as I was thinking about it, you know, I think he's a villain in my own private Idaho. You just forget until that very last moment when you realize every that last moment when he turns on Pigeon and he turns on this life in a villainous way. We've forgotten that he was always planning to leave this community. He was always planning to play on their uh, adoration and enamorment of him and walk away when he came into money, which in my opinion is villainous. So I think that there's something to be said for Keanu Reeves as a good guy through the vast majority of his films and the kind of villain he embraces, the kind of villainy he embraces. And isn't it interesting, the two times up until now that he plays villains are the two times he's played Shakespeare on film. Yes. So uh, now my own private idol was a little more complex because playing Hal, even though he's not called that there, but essentially the, the Henry V role, he reads lines from uh, those Henry IV uh, uh, things, um, is one, one, of the, I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things in all of English literature is when he rejects uh, his friend. But because of the context in which that's in, it's a different kind of villainy. But yeah, it is interesting that the two characters that do really unlikable things are both his two Shakespeare uh, plays. And in, in especially in uh, Much Ado, he doesn't get to be, he's just a villain. There's a difference between a villain and an anti-hero. Anti-heroes, you can have these kind of great, uh, you know, I guess Tony Soprano was an anti-hero. Uh, Don John is not an anti-hero, though he is anti-hero, the character hero, who he completely uh, yes. ruins the <laughs> life of, but he's not an anti-hero. And uh, so that doesn't allow any of the kind of noble, what is the the, the last uh, the last bit, and I, I can't remember these exact lines, but uh, they, they catch him, he's escaped, and they catch him after we've had the double marriage and all the happy endings and they um, you know ask the governor what, what's going to happen to the now captured Don John think not on him till tomorrow I'll devise the brave punishments for him <laughs> so we get the sense that not only is he going to end like any great uh, villain ends um, but it's going to be really creative he's going to die worse than uh, um, you know the end of speed where the head gets taken off on the subway kind of thing yes. um, so it is interesting that his two uh, maybe most highbrow roles that he's played, uh, he both both plays a villain. I don't know the whole history of that ca- uh, casting. Is that the role Kenneth Branagh offered him, um, or is that the uh, 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 is that the role he chose to take? I think Keanu Reeves playing Ted could have been a really interesting Dogberry, but Michael Keaton got that role and did a pretty killer good job at it. Are you good men and true? Being chosen for the princess watch. This is your charge. You are to bid any man stand. I will say that having seen him, and, and I, I find his portrayal of Don John in this film compelling, 
interesting. Uh, I think it's a wonderful role. And it, it makes me wish I could see him as Iago or as Richard III. I think Keanu Reeves could do an extraordinary Richard III. And we know he's capable of memorizing the lines. Let's see here. When Branagh was first approached by Reeves, who made initial contact, he had the distinct impression the actor was not in the market for yet another juvenile lead. He had nothing specific hmm. in mind, but he knew Much Ado was on the cards, and we met when he was passing through London, Branagh said. He never spoke about it, but it would be hard to have been unaware of the way he'd been bracketed, chiefly because of the Bill and Ted movies, which I had always admired, because it seemed to me they required a degree of real comic skill. This is Branagh saying This it. is Branagh. Oh, nice. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the perceived wisdom was that he had fallen into them and was the male bimbo type. He didn't seem bothered by it. I didn't sense an angry guy resist resisting this, but someone who wanted to play every variety of character and realized that, looking as he does and having a certain innocence as well, which some people confuse with the lack of intelligence, he would have to work hard to jiggle their imaginations a bit. Hmm. It was clear that it would interest him much more to play something villainous than to play the more conventional romantic juve. End quote. Branagh, I'll just keep going, because this is this part I no, raised. That, that, that's all very interesting yeah. and relevant. Branagh was also a little surprised at the extent to which Keanu had done his homework on the play, which he had seen several times on stage. There was no modern film version. That was an impressive thing, says Branagh. There were no sense of, I'm a Hollywood star coming to do you a favor because my casting might be important to the completion of the money. Sometimes you get that. It was sort of a passionate enthusiasm. He was quoting lines from the play to me over lunch, but without advertising his swattiness. He was very bright about it, not only the images and the structure of the language, which he did talk about with some technical knowledge, but also the general way in which the play spoke to him. He responded to it with some degree of poetic imagination, end quote. And so it was that Keanu ended up as the malevolent Don John, <laughs> the character who seemed to hate everyone as a result of a mysterious feud with his brother and who engineered Claudio's near tragic misunderstanding. I mean, that's very interesting. And that, that gives us kind of the context. And, and Keanu, of course, was no stranger to Shakespeare when he went to this. But I love the idea of... And I could certainly understand this, that doing Don John, where you're not smiling, you're, you're a totally different character than Ted, uh, was a great idea. But I have to, there's at one point in the um, play, one of the few lines Don John gets, where uh, he gets, uh, they're coming into the town or whatever, and he goes, The most exquisite Claudio. And I can so hear mm. Ted saying, Oh, the most exquisite Claudio. <laughs> I mean, that was, in, in an odd sort of way, when Keanu Reeves plays Shakespeare, we realize that Ted and Bill, for that matter, talked in a lot of Shakespeare kind of ways. Those yes. overly puffy uh, um, uh, words. Bill and Ted had a certain Elizabethan quality uh, to them. And frankly, I think Shakespeare would have loved Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, Shakespeare could have used the phrase excellent adventure with no problem whatsoever. There's actually a really great bit in here where they talk about, uh, you know, the two times in Hamlet when Hamlet says excellent, there was oh, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely by the audience. So then um, let's talk a little bit more because there's so few Keanu mo moments in Much Ado. What was your favorite Keanu moment in Much Ado? Oh, that's OK. I mean, this is stupid. No, it's not. It's uh, there's no lines. But um, in the very beginning, when they're 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 all coming back, everybody's so excited for the uh, the men to return and to the castle. And they're walking in the castle. flying V. Yeah, yeah but there's that. a close there's there's six close ups uh, that everybody gets the main characters. And Keanu's close-up scowling on that horse <laughs> is just about the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so um, even before he gets to speak, or even before any of that, uh, 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 you know, any of that happens, um, there is that, and it, it almost sort of this this eroticized Western. You remember a movie yeah. called Young Guns? Yes. Dermot Mulroney. I forget who else was uh, uh, in it, but the idea of ma making the Western uh, uh, sexy. Um, uh, though those that that line of close-ups where he gets to share the exact same composition with Denzel, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, by the time that happened in the movie, I realized that Beatrice and Benedict, I could care less about what's going to happen to them. These are the two that I want to pay attention yeah. to. You know, I, almost always, I would love to see a Rosencrantz and Gildenstern 
narrative starring Keanu Reeves at any point? Because I feel like Bill and Ted is by definition a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Are, are you a I fan of the I never thought I am very much a fan of that play, and yeah. I never that never which has got Hamlet running throughout it, yes. so he did know half the lines. Yeah. Um, I'd never thought of that, but that is a beautiful, beautiful idea. Yeah, I would love to see. Maybe that's what they'll do for Bill and Ted Face the Music. It'll just be Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Let's, in our next episode, pretend that happened, and we'll discuss it as though it had. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think my favorite mo moment in Much Ado is, uh, I guess there's always those moments where I believe Keanu's acting, and as a note, it's almost never consistent, right? Like there's always a moment I believe more than the other moments. And the one moment in Much Ado is when he approaches Claudio and Don Pedro after they've mocked Benedict and he's left the room. My lord and brother, God save you. Good evening, brother. If your leisure served, I would speak with you in private. If it please you, yet Count Claudio may hear for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter and aim better at me by that I now will manifest. Means your lordship to be married tomorrow. You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. In that delivery, in that confrontation to Claudia and Don Pedro, I believed it. And coming back to Point Break, when he's lying to uh, Tyler, and we know he's lying. We come back here, he's lying, and we know he's lying. But in those, like, meta lies, I believe them. And there's a uh, line, both in Shakespeare and, of course, in the uh, Brano uh, movie, which sums this all up Which it, toward, at the end, when they're figuring it all out, when everything is about to end happy, uh, when someone says, My lady hero hath been falsely accused. <laughs> the prince and Claudio mightily abuse, and Don John is the author of all. Which pretty much says it. Don John, everything, and you said this in the beginning of this, every problem that made this not just a comedy, but also a potential tragedy and a melodrama and all the rest of it has been written but none other than our friend Keanu Reeves. Absolutely. Don John is the author uh, of all. And once he gets exposed and once he uh, flees and then is caught again, um, it's able to become the nice romance that it started with, with all the hey, nani, nani, and all this kind of stuff, uh, which then gets derailed by Don John and gets to come back to a nice, you know, double wedding and all the other uh, uh, ha happy kind of things. Um, he doesn't get a, li a lot of lines, but he is not only a real scoundrel, but he's incredibly powerful for his man of few words. Exactly, and I think for me, especially given Dracula's collective popular flop for Keanu Reeves, um, it's this role that manages for lack of a better term, to swallow Ted, right? Actually, you know, for me, this is simultaneously, as all the roles are, in my opinion, draws on and talks back to Ted because Don John is evil Ted from Bogus. Oh, Journey. yeah, I'd forgotten about evil straight Ted. Straight up evil Ted. Ah, got a robot chubby. Like, <laughs> straight up evil Ted. Um, and I think that there's a joy in that, that, you know... He seems, like Branagh said, he's, he doesn't seem bothered by being tagged with Ted, but at the same time, he's going to play on it and force it back to you that you think he's Ted. Yeah, that's very nice. And, and leave it to you to, uh, to remember, which I had forgotten, a bogus journey, which I think that is important in this, uh, uh, in this interpretation. So I, everything you just said, I think, is really insightful. And also there's this, we've now had him in enough films that we're starting to understand this kind of consistent delivery. And it's not just staccato, whatever, but there is a Keanu style that Bill and Ted movies actually have less of than others, but where he, even in my own private Idaho, certainly in Point Break, where he is a man of few words, and it may not just be the script he's being given. It's kind of his delivery, uh, where they're kind of um, they're curt, they're terse. There's not a whole lot of emotion in them, and uh, he might get take this to its most absurd level in the John Wick movies, where. Yes. Okay, we know he liked his wife and we know he liked his dog, but other than that, we get um, uh, 
Yeah. He even shoots a gun with a sense that we know nothing about what he's doing when yeah. he does it. Uh, and the man of few words, right? I, I am man of few words, but I thank you. I feel also sums up uh, Keanu Reeves' again approach to the craft of Hollywood. I'm not even going to call it the craft of acting, right? Because Hamlet has 1,500 plus lines and he delivered all of them. I think I know where you're going with this. But the, really? Because I'm not quite sure where I'm going. But the, <laughs> like, it sums up his craft of Hollywood. Again, uh, not necessarily needing to be the front man, but in that regularity, again, I'll say it, that every man, uh, his simplicity of character invites the audience to empathize with him. So when we ask, you know, how many, has any other bad actor been in so many great movies? It's because we see ourselves or we aspire to see ourselves in the simplicity of Keanu, which will bring me to Little Buddha. But before we get there, what are your thoughts? Yes, the, it, it, I mean, he is, a, for, for someone who has been in so many movies, for someone who is, let's face it, his biggest star as he is, uh, 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 as he is um, you don't hear a lot about him. You, you don't, uh, uh, you know, every night when you turn on Inside Edition or Extra or whatever, uh, there are seldom a Keanu Reeves story. Um, one gets the sense that uh, when he is approached by uh, paparazzi and journalism, he, and, and, you know, he says, I am a man of few words and I thank you when he goes into his house or yes. where, uh, wherever he goes. So, um uh, there is that sense, and I think it, 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 in my mind, it's emerging as we now watch these all uh, in a row again, um, how much that is consistent, not only in his style of acting and the kinds of films that he's, he's um, uh, chosen or that have been offered uh, to him, but there is a theory of Hollywood, and I think you're right to make the distinction, not a theory of acting, although that may be there as well, but a theory of the entire in entertainment industrial complex, which he has managed in his quiet way to, to play. He, he has not been involved, as far as I know, in a major scandal uh, uh, yet at this point. He's still alive. Yeah. He's, he's had still some very public losses. Oh, oh yes, yeah. very much so. But uh, he's still getting work. His uh, uh, very early work is resurrecting again in Bill and Ted. His much later work is coming back again in John Wick. Um, I mean, this guy has played Hollywood pretty well. If he's got a theory of Hollywood, it's one we might want to pay attention to. Absolutely. And this was also what brought me to really, to much ado, because that was not on my list because his role was so small. But I'm so glad that we have chosen to discuss it. I am but, too. It's one of my favorite roles of his. It's short, but uh, I, I think he... Uh, it's definitely not Playing sweet. Shakespeare is not easy to do, and I think he did it really, really well. Yeah. Uh, what also brought me to it is that same theory has has been vocalized by Denzel Washington. And so now I'm really curious about what does a Keanu-Denzel friendship look like? And we will never know. It's none of our business. Both of them have decided it's none of our business. But, uh, and Denzel, I believe, said in GQ that Sidney Poitier told him once oh, that yeah, uh, right. <laughs> if they pay to see, or no, if they see you every day during the week, they won't pay to see you on the weekend, right? That there is no need for you to be in the public eye every other day, every other Entertainment Tonight episode, and do your job and go home to your life. You are still a human being. The world does not own you. And I think that the, the parallel between those two and being brothers in this film is really a demonstration of what a star study is, both their reality and what they give to us on screen. I agree, but let's go further. Please. If Poitier really said that, yes. and whenever someone says, as Sidney Poitier once told me, <laughs> you gotta be a little suspicious of whatever comes after that. Um, but if Poitier really said that, I presume he said it, what, 20 years ago or early in Denzel's career, then Poitier is a real genius because what he has essentially said is that all this Twitter, all this Facebook, it is not good for your star thing. If they're going to pay to see you uh, uh, in the movies, uh, you are going to dilute that by constantly giving yourself to them day after day after day with your opinion and your lunch and everything else uh, that happens. I tend to agree with that idea. I think the idea, uh, the notion when stars were something maybe you could see on The Tonight Show. Maybe you could see when they made their acceptance speeches at the Academy Awards. But otherwise, they were rare 
commodities. Um, start, you bought the magazine so you could so have you could access. get tiny little bits yeah. and pieces of their fabulous just whatever. Just like us. Now um, you can get way more information, intimate information about most big stars than you can about me, who doesn't have a Twitter account. Not that you'd want it, but um, and if if Poitier was kind of predicting the whole thing that would become social media and stars' obsessive need to give everything, um, then I think we should take him even more seriously than we already did. And it seems like Denzel Washington has. He's another guy who, again, we don't see every time we, uh, uh, we turn on the E! Entertainment Network. And I think also it, when you're so... Uh, I don't want to say withdrawn because that's got a pejorative sense, but when you're restricted and make sure to keep your personal life personal, every time Keanu is in the public eye, it goes viral. Like that moment where he's just sitting on a bench eating his sandwich. Oh, that's a meme. There was another one where he was on the New York City subway and gave up his seat for a woman, and that video went viral. And so suddenly you're getting, you're going back to the tabloids, right? You're getting these tiny little glimpses and those glimpses become everything on which you build the narrative of this person. But in reality, you have no idea who this person is. And I think that that is also what he brings to the screen. I agree. Yeah. Salinger, Poitier, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Let's talk about the third one. Now that we're starting to get into the philosophy of Keanu, uh, his approach to Hollywood, his approach to uh, roles, his approach to life, let's talk about Little Buddha. In watching the adrenaline video of Point Break, where they have everyone coming back and talking about the Point Break, Harp says one of his favorite lines that he still has internalized to this day is, you know nothing. In fact, you know less than nothing. If you knew that you knew nothing, then that would be something, but you don't, right? It's like this beautiful kind of soliloquy in this delivery. And I just, as I was thinking about it, and as I was thinking about our conversations about what Bill and Ted learn, that is a beautiful uh, quote to then apply to Bill and Ted. You know nothing. And if you knew that you knew nothing, that would be something, but you don't. But then they come around, they're like, maybe we should learn how to play. <laughs> they learn something. Well, that's the, we, we could spend forever discussing uh, this because it is um, that quote from where point break of all things, yes. not exactly the first on the list of the AFI preserved films, um, but not only does it link to Bill and Ted, and that that lesson that knowing nothing might be some, something that you've got to uh, rectify, but it also foreshadows little Buddha. That is a Buddhist statement. You know nothing, if you only knew you knew nothing, but the difference between Bill and Ted and, and Buddha is that with Buddha, you know nothing, once you realize you know nothing, then you, you have achieved something, something. Yeah. yes. Um, you know, somewhere between Bill and Ted and Socrates lies this whatever. But it, and I'm I'm finding the more and more you and I are talking about the further we get into this Keanu series, the more I'm realizing what elegant continuity there is. And I'm not sure how much of it, uh, you know, Keanu was figuring out is because some of it is retroactive. Right. But there is a really, really satisfying sense of continuity. And who would have guessed that a point break quote of all things would have so nicely linked Bill and Ted to Little Buddha um, in, in, I think, ways that are significant interpretive, uh, has significant interpretive value. Yeah, I completely agree. As I'm watching Little Buddha, of course I'm thinking of Bodhi, right? And I'm thinking of what is Keanu... Bodhisattva, right? Exactly. What is Keanu bringing to this role, and when is... Buddhist enlightenment applicable to a live by the seat of your pants, freewheeling surfer lifestyle, point one. Is it? Is it not? I, I'm having my own philosophical debates on the connection between these data points in Keanu Reeves's career. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's this holistic nothing matters sentiment that comes out in Point Break that I think Keanu is bringing into this role. Uh, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
and we'll get into what uh, some of my favorite moments. I'm so glad you brought that up because you, of course, are coming to this with some sophisticated star studies, Richard Dyer, all this uh, kind of thing. And Keanu Reeves is one of these guys, it's a little, you know, it's one thing when we're talking about Olivier and it's another thing when we're talking about Meryl Streep and all these, whatever. But there really is a sense that you may be now starting to get to what really is the core of his performance uh, ideal. It's, it's not so much method acting, though he does that. He totally got into his Hamlet. He totally got into Buddhism and Research, all that. Researches right. deeply. Right. It researches deeply. So he's got, he's got some of the method in him. But we talked briefly before of this tabula rasa, this idea that, you know, he manages to let these characters kind of pour into, but he always remains essentially the same Keanu. And that's an interesting acting philosophy. And it may be one that a lot of people have a hard time, that might be why they have a hard time taking seriously. Because let's face it, when his character in Little Buddha decides he's going to become an aesthetic and gets his hair cut, he looks like Ted. Absolutely. And, and it's like a perfect clean Ted. Yes. It's, and oh. that, that it's hard not to laugh at yes. that. But when you look at the whole body of his career, it's like there is this one kind of uniquely American, but vaguely he is, after all, Canadian, and he's got these various uh, racial um, gene pool uh, stuff in him. But I guess that makes him this kind of unique American character. One minute, it's a Shakespeare character. The next minute, it's actually Siddhartha. Uh, and then it's a surfer dude. It's an action adventure. It's a murderer in John Wick. And they're all kind of the same, but when the whole body of work, it's really extraordinary. Absolutely. Here's the thing. The answer to the question of Keanu Reeves is the third variable problem. That is to say, mm. you know, we're seeing these correlations between films, you know, less critically minded people who think what we do is bull uh, would say, oh, you're just making up associations. But... The truth is the associations are present. Whether they were intentional or unintentional is beside the point. They're present right. to the audience, whether or not the audience is aware of them. Both right? right, It yes. takes a close reading, but these similarities are not because Little Buddha is similar to Point Break, but rather Keanu Reeves in Little Buddha is Keanu Reeves in Point Break, and therefore what he brings to the role is really the crux of the entire conversation and the whole purpose of a star study as a methodology in the first place. And if further than that, a lot of the directors who otherwise directed what would have been relatively undistinguished films have should be sending Keanu Reeves a basket of fruit for, in some ways, redeeming some of those films as something much more important because Keanu Reeves was in them. Yes. Do you remember the um, Honey, I Shrank the Kids? Yes, I used to movies? love that movie. I always th thought this should be called uh, uh, Honey, Our Kid is a, a, is a Reincarnated Monk. <laughs> because <laughs> in many ways, this is too... I suppose the one we're about to talk to is Keanu's film, right. which is, I think, a really nice, even sweet retelling of Siddhartha's story, which is an old story from uh, uh, way, way back. And then there's this other story uh, we about, talk about, about the other story. this, you know, this <laughs> man and a woman and their kid from Seattle and whatever, which has got a kind of honey, I shrank the kid's quality to it. Not that it isn't charming in its own way, but one of them is kind of uh, these, you know, charming, our kid is somehow unusual. Um, but it's whenever the kid is reading that book and then that kind of melds into the rest of it where we have this other movie. Little Buddha, the story of Prince Siddhartha. Buddha was born 2,500 years ago in a small kingdom in ancient India. I find the movie about the kid who may be, and then the three kids who may be uh, um, uh, this uh, monk uh, uh, reborn, a fun, clever, cute little movie. I find the Siddhartha story a much more interesting and enduring uh, film. I almost wish there was a DVD extra where they just had that section so that on third and fourth viewing, I wouldn't have to watch the rest of it. On that note, though, as you're describing the the parents, right? Isn't it crazy? Our kid could be this monk. At the same time, that's the king's approach to Siddhartha, yes, right? You know, like you're my right. child you're right. is uh, is not 
is not living in my footsteps. This is crazy. Why do you want to go outside? Why do you want to go to Bhutan? You know, like it's the parallels are there. And honestly, watching it, I didn't see them. And I'm thinking about it now. So, no, you know. you're right. I'm sorry. I t- everything I just said, I take back. Because no. you're absolutely right. <laughs> and then also the whole, the intense Christian subtext in here. Yes. Forget subtext. They mention it sp- specifically. Uh, the whole idea of Mary, the whole Magnificat. I, I'm what? I'm the son of whom? He's going to do what? Uh, kind of thing. So we've got, you're right, we've got the Siddhartha. And then she's pregnant. And, and then, she, exactly. So we've got both Siddhartha's story, the mother of this contemporary Seattle child story. Conrad is the family name. Conrad, oh, there you go. And then we've got this this Christian story, which is constantly being blended into the uh, Siddhartha story for obvious uh, uh, obvious reasons. So I was being too smug. You're right. To take that other story out of it uh, would be to do a serious injustice to this film. But I completely agree that there are two parallel films that are being told interspersed. Uh, having said that, just to make connections, because that's really all I'm doing at this point, it really felt like The Princess Bride starring Carrie Elways, who was also in Dracula. Um, but <laughs> that... Uh, Very nice. Yes, 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 yes. Um, this... Let, let's talk about the Siddhartha film, because that that is what Keanu brings. And it's important to note that Keanu's performance exists independent of the rest of the cast. I believe Chris Isaac won a Razzie for uh, Worst Acting. Um, I believe you're right about that. Yes. Oh, no. He was nominated. I don't think he won. But... Oh, man, he can't even win a Razzie. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, to, to talk about uh, Siddhartha and uh, Keanu Reeves as Siddhartha... One of the factoids that I really enjoyed was, you know, Bertolucci shot the modern day on 35 millimeter and then the uh, Siddhartha narrative on 65 millimeter, thus creating a visceral distinction between the now and the then. uh, But it's kind of interwoven between these two things. And if we talk about Keanu Reeves, what does Keanu, who is Keanu Reeves? He's Siddhartha. What does he bring to this role? Uh, Bertolucci talked about going through India and looking for actors and was amazed that he found his Siddhartha on Santa Monica Boulevard, I think it was. <laughs> and, you know, he brings this beautiful innocence to the role, just as Ken- Kenneth Branagh said, that these in this classic sense and classic texts, classic scripts, that... Keanu's holistic, uh, wholesome, beautiful innocence is what is either being deployed in the case of John Harker and Siddhartha or being uh, undercut in the case of Don John, that that's what he's bringing. It's his physicality and his sort of open blankness, which is mocked as a surfer, but also kind of perfect for the epiphany, the nirvana, the the nothingness of the goal of meditation, this mental emptiness that allows you to look at your thoughts as if they were clouds passing by. Okay, so much there. First of all, I don't know why Bertolucci was surprised. Uh, given the fact that uh, uh, nirvana is about achieving this kind of no- nothingness and whatever, uh, I think you're as likely to find that on Santa Monica, in Santa Monica <laughs> than anywhere else. So that, that, that wouldn't, uh, uh, doesn't surprise me at all. And you point out about how 35 millimeter and 65 millimeter, the two sections of those films were so clearly different. Yes. I mean, it was almost like you'd gotten up uh, and to get popcorn and came back to the, the wrong cinema. I mean, one is these reds and oranges, and uh, th- this is the uh, the Asia section. Right. Um, and then Seattle is much more these blues and grays and all of these uh, kind of thing. And I think that was very artfully done because this had the potential. I mean, it's pretty obvious when we were where, but it had the potential being confusing. Visually, it didn't confuse us at all. We knew when we were bopping back and forth. And then when those kids become part of the, you know, the, the Siddhartha narrative, then the scenes, that, that's yeah. interesting, uh, um, uh, interesting as well in a number of, uh, uh, in a number of ways. Um, the, the whole idea too, and, and this is, this is where I think, again, I'm regretting saying, I wish they would edit this to a version with only the Siddhartha story because, the story of how uh, 
who would become Siddhartha is originally um, living essentially in Eden. The kid is being totally protected. He's not allowed to see poor people. He's not allowed to see suffering. He has no idea of anything but peacocks and music and wonderful food and all the rest of it. Tell me, who are those men? They are men like the rest of us, my lord, who once sucked milk from their mother's breast. And why do they look like that? They are old, my lord. What do you mean, old? Old age destroys memory, beauty, and strength. In the end, he happens to us all, my lord. To everyone? To you and to me? It is better not to concern yourself with these things, my lord. And I think there are a lot of middle and upper middle class parents who are probably trying to do a very similar thing uh, to their kids, just not let them suffer uh, uh, at all. And then, of course, he, for one reason or another, wanders out and he sees that there are people out there that suffer. Uh, he, in fact, takes the apple of knowledge and he, he leaves Eden. Yes. Um, and I think in some ways the fact that these parents in Seattle are bringing up a kid at about that age where you're, you're still trying to make sure that nothing ever bad happens Even to them. Even though the world is falling apart outside but, and the yes, friend is going bankrupt and all of these exactly. things are happening outside. They're still trying, ah, it'll all be fine, honey. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually one of the beautiful things about this film that I like for a lot of different reasons. I look at this movie more and more each time I see it. But that is one of the really nice things that that part of... Siddhartha's story is one that a modern, fortunate American family uh, uh, can really identify with, because I think a lot of modern, fortunate American families try to do that with their kids. And this story tells us that that is not only hopeless, it's completely wrong-minded. Um, and the, only, the, the best thing that the kid can do, if that's what you're trying to do, is to get out and... Uh, See the world. Uh, and... And see the world, yeah. yeah. And see the suffering and look it in the face and understand where you fit into this puzzle. And for me, I think my favorite moment, I've got some other favorite moments, but my hands down favorite moment is when he comes to the beggar, which is also part of Herman Hesse's Siddhartha and other retellings of Siddhartha, is when he comes and uh, enters the forest and first approaches the ascetics um, and comes into contact with a beggar wearing nothing but dirty robes and they switch clothes. And I believe mm. it's just a quick cut Bertolucci does it. Like you see them standing and then you see them flipped clothes. Uh, Very Shakespearean. Quite. So, yeah. Oh, no, Billy Bon. Have mercy. I am nothing. I am nothing. So the prince gave up his robes to the beggar and set off alone into the woods. Right, that uh, that is probably my favorite moment because of its simplicity in this over-the-top story that they're telling. But I really appreciate because I don't think I gathered this when I first saw it, and it's only coming to me as we're having this conversation, is the way in which these stories are not just uh, interspersed. Right, this isn't the Princess Bride. Right, it's not just interspersed that the retelling of Siddhartha gives us a lens with which to understand our current day and age. So when, for me, as I was thinking, you know, who is Keanu? What is the purpose of this movie? And what does he bring to this role? This movie, and the producers have said repeatedly, was about kind of selling Buddhism to a Western audience. This is the popular understanding in the narrative of free Tibet, right? In the narrative mm, of the late 80s, early go. 90s, with that sort of holistic spirituality that was uh, in the public discourse. This is them bringing the understanding of Buddhism to the West. You know, they had multiple uh, monks in the script, they had, or in the film, they had a prominent. A teacher who was the consultant. Bertolucci even went and got blessings from the Dalai Lama so mm -hmm. that when people confronted him and said, well, a Western director and a Western actor shouldn't be telling Siddhartha a story, he forwarded them the letter he from the Dalai Lama. pulled out his Dalai Lama, Lama card. Yeah. No, let me give you the exact quote because it's so wonderful. I wish I had one of those cards. I know, right? Um, Whenever anyone wrote objecting to the project, he simply whisked his ace out from up his sleeve and <laughs> mailed them back a copy of the Dalai Lama's letter saying that there was nothing wrong with a Western director and a Western actor making a film about the Buddha if there was illumination in their hearts. And so, you know, we could talk about what Bertolucci and Reeves together, 
forget Bridget Fonda, forget Chris Isaac, forget the whole Conrad story. Although to some degree that story is the manifestation of the audience on screen. They are learning about Buddhism through uh, the chance situation of the sun and the exploration of this entire community and this entire spiritual journey as we are learning through watching them on the screen. Exactly. And watching Keanu Reeves. Um, but together, who is going to bring us Siddhartha? And I hate this quote from Ridley Scott when he was talking about Kings of Egypt, he said, you know, people were like, why did you cast Christian Bale as Moses? I believe it is. And he's like, well, what am I going to do? Hire Muhammad so-and-so from such and such, which is the most pithy phrase. And it just makes me despise Ridley Scott more. But when we think about introducing a whole new world of thought to a Western audience, Painting it on Keanu Reeves, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively, is how American audiences would give this the time of day. We are the Chris Isaacs in the theater. Yeah, that's a tough, the whole, what, uh, at least since Masters of None has talked about brownface, yes. and before that uh, uh, as well. Though there is this one elephant in the room with this movie is that, in fact, uh, uh, Keanu Reeves plays um, uh, Siddhartha and he plays it in some form of Indian brownface. I don't I'm not in the makeup department there, but oh, clearly he was done up. He's darkened. He's got his Indian American English accent going, which goes away is. a little bit into the film, yeah. thankfully. But uh, and and that that is one of, I think, the the kind of recurring problems that will probably become bigger problems the longer the older this film uh, uh, gets it's like the f word in in bill and ted um now keanu reeves of course has got himself a wide ethnic mix in his gene pool he's got what some chinese some hawaiian some uh, european european uh whatever but they're, born they're, in Lebanon, right? Right, born in Beirut. So he's he's he certainly. It's not like uh, you know, casting carrot top in the role of Sir <laughs> Siddhartha. Oh, gosh. However, I'll never get that out of my head now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I hadn't said that. Um, however, there is a sense that, given the fact that this was a relatively small role, he only appears in you know the. Siddhartha uh, stories that, uh, given all the other roles that they gave to other monks and everything, that, that other people could have played this. So the question is, do you justify that Keanu Reeves becomes the Trojan horse by which you bring Buddhism into the mainstream? Okay, I guess I could buy that. But then again, um, what if someone made that argument about uh, putting someone in blackface as opposed to brownface? Because the only way we're going to get them to learn about slavery is if we, you know, have Clooney black starring. Black like me. In, uh, black like me. Uh, as a book was what brought the white consciousness to this discussion. There you go. So I, I think that is a complex issue. Absolutely. I don't know that I am wise enough to get to the bottom of, uh, uh, of that. Um, I have to say, when I first saw Keanu in all of the makeup of uh, Siddhartha, um, the first time I saw him as an aesthetic in the Ted uh, haircut, uh, I laughed. The first time I saw him browned up and everything, I thought, ooh, that's a little weird. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what we do with that. If the Dalai Lama says it's okay, I guess who am I to, uh, <laughs> uh, who am I to argue? Um, but it's not, Keanu, I think, did a, great job at giving that kind of spiritual otherworldliness, but it's not like he's the only one in the world that could have done that. And it's not like there isn't someone from the region from which Siddhartha came that probably couldn't have done that either. Absolutely. I think, you know, so Ben Kingsley as Gandhi was 12 years before this one, right? And so, you know, Frankly, we're still having conversations of brownface. We are not as sensitized to it as we are to blackface um, or other ethnic faces, right? We still have the Redskins football team and have people literally painting their face red every Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday night, right? We still cast uh, stars of shows about trans people who aren't trans people. Exactly. So, you know, 
it's a it's a slow march to woke, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's the title of your memoirs. <laughs> slow march to woke. That's a good one. Or maybe be. the title of my memoir. <laughs> The, so no one ever had a problem at the time. You know, you go back and you look at all the reviews. There was no discussion of the brown face. The problem was never Keanu Reeves's casting of this role. Uh, and in you, if you look at the social media conversations, they're basically like some pithy tweets here, there, and everywhere. There's like, hey, let's not forget Keanu Reeves did brown face. And people are upset about it. But then at the same time, a lot of them read him as white. And so the response to that, well, he's not completely white, even though he's had, you know, he's played these roles that have been uh, hegemonic, for lack of a better term, right? Some people read him as white. A lot of the directors talk about his ethnic ambiguity and the beauty in his ethnic ambiguity that mm. comes to these roles and his physicality. And at this point, I'm just listing all of the considerations we have about Keanu's brown face. But in this day and age, in 2019, I feel like we have to talk about the brown face. We have to acknowledge that mm -hmm. he put on an accent, especially after that horrific nonsense in Dracula. He tried to put on an accent that he knew was not perfect and loses it partway through the film, you know, that at what point is he trying to embody the spirituality of the Buddha or at what point is he playing a historical figure? Again, I do not think that this gives the brown face a pass, but he has explicitly said, despite having, like, this brought him to Buddhism as well. And uh, I, I'm trying not to read as much Sheila Johnston as I can, but there's just, there's so much brilliant stuff in here. Um, Keanu was drawn to many aspects of Buddhism, especially in its disregard for impermanent material possessions. His iterant childhood left him with little interest in these, and indeed later, at the very moment when speed made him financially able to buy a spectacular villa, he voluntarily became homeless, basing himself in a series of hotels and taking pride in living out of a suitcase. All right, so his... Well, Surfer. homeless in a series of hotels, by yeah. the way, are two different things. <laughs> I imagine he was not staying at the Ramada Inn on I-95. No, no. He was staying at the uh, oh, Chateau Marmont, which is uh, <laughs> right. where I believe... Uh, Belushi was, died. Yeah. yeah. So the... Yeah. I, I do not want to say that his brown face is acceptable. Having said that... This thing happened. So <laughs> let's talk about what this thing means and how it brings Keanu Reeves into the public consciousness as an ethnically ambiguous, uh, I can play everything with a level of blankness figure that counters the Bill, the Ted, the uh, Speed, and the Point Break. Okay. Okay. Now, far be it for me to defend brownface, yeah, which I don't want to do, that. and uh, uh, I don't want to be in my, the chapter of my slow road to woke, or whatever you're calling it. <laughs> march. Uh, slow march. <laughs> um, oh, that's even creepier. <laughs> but I suppose there are some narrative ways in which one can structure some of this uh, argument, in that Buddhism in general, I think, although I am not a Buddhist monk by any means, and this movie in particular makes the argument that the road to nirvana, the road to enlightenment, is one that is available to anyone. And this movie makes a big argument for that because two of the characters that are perhaps this reincarnated monk, uh, uh, Raju and Gita, are from the region. Gita calls him out and says, you're a foreigner. Right, but he's a foreigner, absolutely. He's this guy from the land of Starbucks, right. Seattle. So I suppose one could make the argument that uh, uh, Siddhartha would not necessarily have to be cast as a East Asian person. South However, Asian. they could have gotten out of this by not having to try to make him look like he's from India or the region at all. Just have him look like Keanu. Um, Siddhartha, I suppose, could be anyone. I think the problem that this film introduces is not in so much casting him as Siddhartha, because Siddhartha could be anyone. It's casting him as Siddhartha as someone from 
the region, which requires the browning up and all the rest of it. And that, I think, is the, the, the harder part of it to justify. Well, I think the Buddha can be anyone. Siddhartha well, is Well, the Buddha, there writer. are millions of Buddhas. Exactly, yeah. right? The Buddha can be anyone. When you achieve enlightenment, that embodiment but, of enlightenment. But, but Siddhartha, Siddhartha is, a, is a historic Is right, a historical right, right, right. figure. And... Th- the slap, the brown face, slap in the face, in my opinion, is the fact that all the actors around him, this yes. is why they had to brown him up. Yes, Because yes. all the actors around him are uh, phenotypically darker. And if you had introduced... Them even worshiping, a, yeah, oh yeah, yeah that would have been bad. Even a tanned Keanu in that narrative, the disparity would be evident, and even though it still is, uh, which, you know... Really is irks me with our brown face narratives, you know, is that Bertolucci has told you like this is in my next question is like how much how aware are you? Where is your slow march to woke? Because you point to the little blonde child and say he's a foreigner. But then you go and cast a foreigner alongside <laughs> oh gosh, all yes. these other locals, for lack of a better term. Right. Uh, people of the community. And you don't see that problem. Uh, again, I feel like it, whose fault is this? Is this Keanu's fault? Is this Bertolucci's fault? Is it the New York Times' fault for not calling it out at the time? But once we get into that loop, then we're just trying to rewrite history. In the end, I think if we're talking about Keanu Reeves and what he brings to the Enlightenment, pro- the the telling of the Siddhartha to Buddha story, this is where I really want to go. Is it just really feels that he's bringing that surfer mentality and giving American audiences, this was a top 20 film in France that year, by the way, uh, bringing to Western audiences a character, both a physicality and a character that they can understand and kind of insert their own uh, representation of what Buddhism is. In my age, the popular Western understanding of Buddhism is still Lisa Simpson. So, you know, how much worse can Keanu Reeves be? But Lisa Simpson is not talking in an Indian dialect. Absolutely. and uh, No, she's uh, leaving that for Apu. Right. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> which we've had documentaries about, and that, that, that very much fits into that. Yes. Um, and I think right now this is a problem for... You're, you're right. I think this movie does a... Credible job in in Buddhism 101, introduction, Buddhism for dummies, whatever you want to call it, uh, kind of thing. And I think a lot of audience members now, especially younger ones, immediately slam on the brakes when they get to his brown face thing because they are conscious of that kind of thing. It's not okay. it, It overwhelms everything else. Probably 50 years from now, when Keanu Reeves is someone that's nobody remembers, you know, when he's an old whatever, that may be less of a problem. But I think it it is a problem for a lot of audience uh, uh, members at this point. That isn't to take away some of the, I think, good things that this uh, uh, film did. You're right. I think this was entry level um, for a lot of uh, people about some knowledge of Buddhism that they may have gone on to, uh, you know, do. It was called Little Buddha. Some others may have gone on to find out about Big Buddha or right. advanced uh, uh, whatever. Keanu himself. Keanu himself. And I think in many ways, this movie brought more to Keanu than Keanu brought to this movie. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but we still can't, I think, ignore the brown face thing. Um, I don't know if, if we're getting toward the end of the discussion, but my favorite part of this film, Keanu, was not in. My particular favorite scene. Um, they go to Kathmandu, Dad and uh, Little and Big Conrad, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, his Game Boy gets stolen. Oh, yeah, yeah. And as he's chasing through, looking for his Game Boy, he gets a tour of Kathmandu. And, and it's the same tour that Siddhartha gets when he runs to follow exactly the old That's exactly right. Man. Yeah. Hey! And what I love so much about this is this is 1993. So yeah. kids are not completely on their screens yet as they would be now. I mean, now our students are all lost in uh, uh, screens. But what a beautiful metaphor that the best thing that can happen to you if you're a uh, an Indian prince whose dad wants to keep you in Eden 
is to run away and see the world. The best thing that can happen to you if you're a spoiled uh, kid that grew up in Seattle is to get your Game Boy stolen. Because once they steal your Game Boy, you have no other choice yeah. but to go out and see the real world outside of Game Boy. And uh, I think that is as moving, more moving today than it was way back in ye olden days of 1993. Absolutely. In your opinion, how do these three films work together to establish Keanu as a public figure? How do they complement each other? How do they confront each other? And how do you want people to be talking about Keanu, given his body of work to date? Well, here we have three films where he plays three classic characters. Someone from Shakespeare, someone from uh, the famous novel Dracula, um, and an ancient myth, Siddhartha. So if ever you're trying to kind of get out of your Bill and Ted stereotype, this would be the way to do it. He does it not once, but three times. But, you know, in Bill and Ted, he was encountering Napoleon and Einstein and Freud. He could have encountered Siddhartha. <laughs> and he, he very well could have in that. Uh, and but, Dracula. And uh, I guess. And what, Shakespeare. You're right. What I take from this is the idea that as much as he is expanding his canon and expanding his uh, roles, which every actor is, of course, told to do if they're going to have an enduring uh, career, how much his acting style is consistent. And that's not to say he's just doing Ted over and over and over again. Whatever he's doing over and over and over again is being adjusted enough to fit, for, fit into Branagh's modernized, Elizabethan, whatever world it is that he uh, presents, enough to fit into Bram Stoker's fantastical... Uh, turn of the century. Turn, yeah, uh, whatever century that might be. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, of course, the kind of ancient days of uh, early Buddhism and all that kind of thing. That he brings this, and you've talked about this before, this kind of blank slate that never goes away. It's the blankness that helps support the little stuff that he builds on each of these roles. And I think as we go through the next many episodes of this, we'll find as Keanu becomes a more mature, an older, a more experienced actor, he never really gives that up, right up into the, uh, the era of John Wick, which we'll get into. I think he, in fact, throws away so many of the uh, principles of what he did. But John Wick and Siddhartha, from an acting standpoint, are not that far apart. Yeah. From a lifestyle standpoint, they couldn't be further apart. But uh, in many ways, we've got a 70% of Keanu was formed in Bill and Ted. And uh, each movie, he puts 30% other stuff on. And that has made for, I think, an absolutely fascinating career. Clearly, and that's why he still draws audiences, is that when you go to see a Keanu Reeves movie, you are expecting this 60-70%, and you're excited to see what he does with the other 30%, but that 60-70% brings us back in time and time again. Which uh, is an important star studies thing. Absolutely. I mean, Dyer spends a lot of time with a lot of jargon saying a lot of things. But that 60-70% is an important part of what that book and what star studies in general are all about. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other things that's worth mentioning, and uh, Sheila Johnston talks about it, although I've clearly found a flaw in her argument. She says, you know, uh, more importantly, it has been said that Keanu Reeves at this point in 1995 or so, 1994, is very much a pacifist, right? And his embrace of Buddhism is kind of in line with his pacifism. And Johnston makes the point that he's not, he has never killed anybody on screen except for Charles Bronson in, I believe it's Age of Vengeance. Um, but that's clearly flawed because we see him kill Dennis Hopper in Speed. Um, if for nothing else besides defense. Uh, but this idea that he is a pacifist, you know, we see that being embraced in Dracula, right? He doesn't want to kill Dracula. It has to be Winona Ryder doing it. So he stops mm, right. the, the mo mob of four or five, whichever the, the renegade group from killing Dracula that we have to stop. It's now 
uh, Mina's turn to say goodbye to her love and all of these things. Speaking of him as a cuckold oh, hero. Oh boy, if you that will. is about as much as he won't kill the person who cuckolded him. The person who he cuckolded him with has to do the killing. Exactly. In Much Ado About Nothing, we see that he is goading Claudio into inadvertently killing uh, killing Hero with mm. slander, right? He doesn't kill her, in big air quotes, he doesn't kill her, but he goads Claudio into committing the deed that leads to her death. Uh, and then in, you know, Siddhartha, and we learn as we're watching Buddhism 101, you know, it's about a respect for all living things. You do not sacrifice the goat. You do not sacrifice the ant, right? What happens if you become reincarnated as an ant? Ants get squished. Well, so do humans, you know? In all of these, we see clearly not Keanu Reeves alone because he's not writing these things, but an embrace of roles that embody pacifism and not just pacifism, but an awareness of and a love for mankind. And the way he brings that to every movie and eventually the tortured nature of John Wick in and of itself is because he has thrown off this assassin and you never really believe him as an assassin until you see him assassinated. <laughs> like 5,000 times per up. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I, I think that is interesting. What, what would really make a fascinating study, mm. and I have certainly not done, but this idea, and I think you very, very aptly lay it out, that Keanu Reeves has embraced a series of roles that have been consistent with the developing identity that he himself yes. has embraced, which includes pacifism and some other things as well. If one really wanted to get to the depths of star studies, it would be interesting to see all of the roles from the very get-go that he has ever been offered. Mm. All of the roles that he really fought for, the roles that he didn't get, and all of these kind of things. The, the big question to me when we're looking at star is auteur, which is what star, stud star studies didn't like to use the word auteur because that's a bad word now. But, right. Um, uh, stars as auteurs. Uh, the star uh, as the author of their own stardom. Right. And that requires us to know so much data. So the big question is, did Keanu Reeves' identity, whatever that means, which includes pacifism and an interest in Buddhism and all this other kind of thing, come from his body of work? Or did his body of work come from and I suspect that is a dance where nobody's leading, that right. both of those things are happening at once. But a really sophisticated star study would have to go back and think and look at, you know, you and I, we get our influence from the people who raise us and our best friends, and the people who we knew as kids and uh, the people who influence us. What's interesting about stars, especially those that start as young in the field as Keanu Reeves did, is that... They're getting all that stuff as well, but they're also being influenced by these things they give huge commitments to, by these roles that they embody. How much of Keanu Reeves' Buddhism went to choosing and to agree to do that role in Little Buddha, and how much did that little role in Little Buddha you know, move him into that uh, direction. Again, I think that is a complicated calculus uh, um, equation, but that's what's really interesting about star studies is that stars, for the most part, are itinerant workers working for big shot directors. That's not the case in everybody, but Keanu is really one of these people. He worked for Bertolucci. He worked for Coppola. He works for, you know, these big names of Van Zandt. Um, and how much Keanu brings to these films and how much Keanu takes from these films is, to me, the really interesting question. And I don't have the, the mathematics, I think, to answer it. So before we go, Bob, I've got a question for you. In what classic story would you like to see Keanu Reeves? Ah, okay. You warned me once that you might ask this question. Yeah. And I've given this some thought. Excellent. He's too old for it now, but if it was back in 1994, I would have loved to see him as Nick Carraway from The Great Gatsby. Um, and for that matter, his contemporary who he co-starred with before, Denzel as Gatsby. 
Ooh. I think that would make a killer uh, casting. Uh, and we know they have chemistry because we saw it in the Much Ado thing. I think he would do make a really fine Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, he's he's we know he can do law uh, shows. We know he can make a, a credible lawyer. He looks good in lawyers' outfits. Oh, Malvolio from Twelfth Night, one of the most abused characters in all of uh, uh, English literature. Uh, and what I'd even more like is a sequel to Twelfth Night. You call it Night 13, where Mal Malvolio goes all John Wick on all of those married couples that end so happily when he vows at the end of that play that he will revenge the whole lot of them. If Mad TV was running, I could see that as yes, a real yes, good yes. Mad TV mashup. But my ultimate one, because it allows all the different things in, in uh, uh, Keanu's acting toolbox, um, would be to play Odysseus in The Odyssey. Mm. He gets to all kinds of action adventure for 10 years while he's making his way back from Troy to Ithaca. Um, we get romantic Keanu because he hangs out with some of those beautiful people on the island. And we get the John Wick Keanu because if you recall, that book ends with him annihilating all those suitors that have been hanging out in his, uh, 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 in his wife's house. Um, and I think he's got that look. I would buy him as the crafty Odysseus sailing the wine-dark wine sea. Mm. I feel like I shouldn't even have an answer because my classics, my understanding and my uh, ability to speak about classics pales in comparison to you. But I, if I had to pick something, I'm, I'm very much a Vonnegut fan. I would love to mm. see him as Kilgore Trout. Mmm, very nice. Just, I've never seen a whole story about Kilgore Trout. He keeps coming back in this narrative and that narrative, but he's such a complex, wonderful character. And we see, you know, we decided not to do ensemble Keanu, but a movie about Kilgore Trout trying to write the next big sci-fi novel and just kind of drifting from story to story in a again, Rosecrans, Guildenstern sort of yeah, ambient yeah, yeah. way, I would like to see Keanu Reeves as Kilgore Trout. That is a most excellent answer, and so much more subtle than mine. Mine were sort of like high school syllabus answers. <laughs> as always, thank you to our producer, Lizzie Goldsmith. Next time, we'll be talking about thriller Keanu, and I'll see you then, Bob. Look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs>